Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle here with some big news that broke today regarding the future of the Walt Disney Company. This is a story that I started tracking here on the channel back in January. You can go back and check those videos if you want an extensive background. But if you don't know what's going on, very briefly, today was the annual shareholders meeting for Disney and they were having an election to see who would be sitting on the board of directors. A lot of times these elections are something that nobody really cares about because there's not a history or a long history of consistent competition competition for the board of directors. But this year was different because there is an investor named Nelson Peltz. He is what many people call an activist investor, which basically means that he'll go to a company, he'll invest heavily in that company, and he'll either join the board of directors by saying, hey, I'd like to be on your board, and they say yes, or he'll engage in what's called a proxy fight, which basically means if a company won't put them on their board of directors, he'll say, all right, I'm taking my case to the shareholders and ask the shareholders to vote him onto the board of directors. And that's what he was doing with Disney in a process that culminated today. Nelson Peltz wanted two board seats, one for him and one for Jay Rusulo, who is a former Disney executive. And the reason that he wanted to be on the board of directors was that he felt that Disney wasn't doing a good enough job, that they could maximize shareholder value even more. And he also thought that there should be a bigger focus on the succession plan for Bob Iger, something that's already failed once with the Bob Chapek era. He felt that the directors in place weren't putting enough focus on that succession plan and that there needed to be more urgency on the part of the board of directors. And personally, I don't disagree with a whole lot of that, but there was a lot more underneath Nelson Peltz's run for the board that I think had much more to do with why he was denied that seat today on the board of directors, along with Jay Rusulo, who is his other nominee. This was a months-long battle that cost both sides tens of millions of dollars, and a lot of people were lining up behind one side or the other in the last few weeks. Bob Iger and the Disney board got high-profile support from people like George Lucas, who has a massive amount of Disney stock due to the sale of Star Wars, former CEO Michael Eisner, the Disney family, Lorene Powell Jobs, Steve Jobs' widow. But Peltz and Tryon also got support from a few major investment groups, which sort of injected the idea that this could be a competition. Ultimately, no changes have been made. The Disney Board of Directors remains the same. There's no addition. There's no shakeup as far as who is on the leadership team. And I don't think that the reason Peltz was denied his seat is necessarily because his message didn't resonate with shareholders. I think it's because he made what I consider to be a critical mistake late in the process. While most of his public statements were about the financial well-being of the company and the strategy regarding Bob Iger's succession, he gave an interview to the Financial Times regarding the output of the Marvel Cinematic Universe specifically that hit last week, which was at the height of a lot of the voting. And in that interview, he said, quote, people go to watch a movie or a show to be entertained. They don't go to get a message. Why do I have to have a Marvel that's all women? Not that I have anything against women, but why do I have to do that? Why can't I have Marvels that are both? Why do I need an all-black cast? Setting aside the fact that Nelson Peltz seems to think that the Captain Marvel and Black Panther movies were only made to send the message and didn't have entertainment value, and setting aside the fact that the Captain Marvel movies didn't have casts that were all women, and the Black Panther movies didn't have all black casts, and setting aside the fact that we can and do have Marvel movies that do have casts that feature more than women and people of color, and setting aside the fact that he called MCU films, quote, a marvel. The argument that Peltz is making here is simply disconnected from the financial reality of how these movies performed. Yes, The Marvels was a very high profile failure for the MCU, their biggest failure yet, but Peltz's statements only reinforce a repeating pattern of behavior when a movie usually starring women or people of color fails at the box office. What a lot of people take away from that is, okay, well, that movie failed, so we should stop making movies that star women and people of color or are directed or created by women and people of color without looking at the franchise's record going back. You self-select one movie and project that onto all of the other movies. Focusing solely on the failure of the Marvel sets aside the fact that Captain Marvel made a billion dollars worldwide 
worldwide. And I can already hear what the detractors are going to say, which is that, well, it just benefited from being right before Avengers Endgame. So even if you take the Captain Marvel movies out of it completely, his statements about Black Panther make absolutely no sense from somebody who wants to run the company better in a financial sense, because both Black Panther movies combined made over $2 billion at the worldwide box office, and who knows how much more in merchandising, and also brought the MCU their only Academy Award wins to date. So as somebody soliciting shareholder votes at the time in this interview, I think that Peltz implied that he would have rejected the idea, or at least fought against the idea, of making the Black Panther films had he been in a decision-making capacity at Disney. And if I were a shareholder considering who to vote for, to me that's an indication that if I voted for Nelson Peltz, he might be a little bit more guided by his personal ideology than by a clear-minded look at the future of the company's finances. And I think that that probably swayed some people to vote against him, because statements like that are much more aligned with Ike Perlmutter, who was taken out of control of Marvel, and who is and was an ally of Nelson Peltz. Those statements statements are much more in his ballpark and not so much the statements of somebody saying, hey, listen, I'm just going to come in and try to right the ship. And listen, I'm not caping for Disney here. I've been critical of them in the past on a corporate level. I think that they have made massive mistakes that have compromised the creative futures of several of their Keystone properties. They absolutely bungled the handover from Bob Iger to Bob Chapik, which only exacerbated the problems that they were already going to have anyway. And I'm not even really opposed to shaking up the board of directors. I think that they have been far too focused on the status quo and not enough on making changes. I'm not saying that some new blood wasn't needed on the board of directors, I'm saying that I don't think that that new blood should have been Nelson Peltz. I think he would have been a disaster on the Disney board and would have only been a distraction when what the company needs to do is to focus. And I think that if Peltz had stayed a little bit more focused on that argument, the financials, the corporate level mistakes that Disney has made in the past, he might have stood a better chance. But this interview that Peltz gave to the Financial Times, I think was either a huge lapse in judgment or some really misguided strategy. Maybe he thought that if he went hard to the quote, anti-woke side of the shareholder base, that that would help to get him some votes in the last days of voting in this proxy war. But I honestly think that that sort of message really only appeals to people who are already aligned with you ideologically, without getting too far into politics, I don't really know how much that resonates by bringing in new people. And I think that the people that were on Peltz's side regarding Captain Marvel and Black Panther and all of that were probably already voting for him in this proxy war anyway. According to the initial results that were released, Peltz only secured about 31% of the vote for his seat. I don't know if we'll ever know the breakdown as far as when those votes came in so that we could see the impact of Peltz's statements to the Financial Times. This was also a decisive victory for Bob Iger. 94% of people who voted voted to keep him on the board of directors. There was also a report that retail shareholders, so not the big investment firms, but the individual people out there that buy Disney stock, voted for the Disney board by a margin of 75% to 25%. And I think that all of these results together should put to rest for now the idea that Iger and the Disney board are on shaky ground with a swingable size of shareholders. There will always be a pocket of shareholders that are not content with what the company's doing, but this was not a squeaker. This was not something where, you know, Bob Iger and the Disney board won by 55% or 51%, and in a year or two, if you could swing just a few more people over to your side, that they could be displaced. Unless there is some major change, some kind of a stagnation, a drop in the share price, it does appear that the future of Iger and this board of directors is secure for now. And the shareholders really seem to want to distance themselves from all political issues because there were various other proposals that were up for a vote that were also defeated. One of them was a request for additional oversight regarding Disney's political contributions. And this was brought by shareholders that were upset that the company had been donating to too many Republican and conservative politicians and causes. Another proposal asked for Disney healthcare coverage to cover the detransitioning of transgender individuals. And another proposal asked for greater accountability for Disney's charitable contributions, saying that the company has a policy that they could not give to highly controversial organizations and that Disney's charitable donations to mainly LGBTQ plus causes violated 
that policy. All of those proposals were rejected by shareholders. I think the biggest mistake that Bob Iger and the Disney board can make right now is to basically take a victory lap, sit on their laurels, and continue to do what they've been doing. Because while this wasn't necessarily a close call, I think that it should have been a wake-up call. Disney and their board of directors opened themselves up to this course of action by making the same mistakes that every media company made over the past five years or so. But I think they also showed a lack of urgency, a lack of urgency over correcting the problems that they have, a lack of urgency regarding who Bob Iger's successor will be. They extended his stay as CEO into 2026. Disney is a company, though, when you look at shareholder price, isn't in some sort of a free fall. Yes, their stock is down from its high highs of around $200, but that was at the peak of the media stock frenzy when everybody expected every company to be the next Netflix, and all of those stocks have taken a tumble. Over the last six months, Disney stock is up 50% over the last year. It's up 20%, and again, it doesn't matter to me what the Disney stock does because I'm not rich. Disney Disney stock is not exactly at a level that I would call investable on my budget. Maybe I can move some numbers around and buy, you know, 10 shares of stocks, but I don't think that's going to make much of a difference at a corporate level. In the long run, I think Disney was kind of lucky because even though this is a months long battle, it was super expensive. It was a distraction. Nelson Peltz was a flawed activist investor. He wasn't really able to stay on message. He had ties to people like Ike Perlmutter, who already had a troubled history with the company and obviously had a personal axe to grind. I think if it had been another investor with a bit of a cleaner history and perhaps somebody who could stay a little bit more on message, then we could have seen a new person on the Disney board and they would have had to make these adjustments or at least face the embarrassment of having some of their board of directors replaced against their will. But because Peltz wasn't able to close the deal, a lot of people might say, well, okay, then everybody's happy with what the board is doing. That's not necessarily the case. I think that Disney should up the urgency, make some changes, take a hard look at what they're doing. They've started that process already. And more than anything, they can't get complacent. Complacency is what got Disney to this point, and they need to put that in the past. Because if they don't, I think they're going to see a lot more fights like the one they just went through in their future. So those are my thoughts on what happened today with Disney, Bob Iger, the Disney board, and Nelson Peltz. What do you think? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, thank you so much for watching the channel. Be sure to stay tuned right here for more movie news, box office reviews, and more. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.